Hi, it's Mr. Mazurkowitz, and in this video, we're going to be taking a look at other patterns of inheritance, or in other words, non-Mendelian genetics. So at this point, you should have a pretty good understanding of Mendelian genetics, which were the foundations of genetics that Gregor Mendel discovered while breeding pea plants. So if you remember, uh, Mendel looked at seven different traits of pea plants, and he crossed them to kind of see what happens. And it was by doing this that he developed his law of segregation, the law of independent assortment, and then his uh, principle of complete dominance. Uh, remember that complete dominance is that if you receive two different alleles for a particular trait, so for example, uh, when he was breeding a tall plant with a short plant, one of those traits would dominate the other. In the case of height, uh, tall would dominate short, so if you got one of each, you would still be tall. So when we talk about other patterns, we now understand in modern genetics that it's not always that easy. Gregor Mendel did a great job being a pioneer and building the foundations of genetics, but there are other patterns that exist, and that's what we're going to cover in this video today. So our essential question is, what role do codominance, incomplete dominance, multiple alleles, sex-linked traits, and polygenic traits play in modern genetics? So we're going to take a look at five other patterns of inheritance outside of just complete dominance and see how that changes the game a bit to really understand uh, what we understand about genetics today. So the first one we're going to take a look at is codominance. Now codominance, if we break that word down, is exactly what it sounds like. Instead of with Gregor Mendel's principle of complete dominance, where one allele dominates the other, in co-dominance, so the prefix co just means together. So that's when two alleles together are going to um, dominate at the same time so you, that you see both. So one great example is in horses. Uh, in some horses, you can actually see in their coat color that if they receive two different alleles for uh, coat color, let's say red and white, they're going to exhibit both at the same time. One does not dominate the other. So you see in this picture of this horse, He's got white hair on his body, some red hairs around his face and his legs. So what happened was he received a red allele from one parent, a white allele from the other, and rather than one dominating over the other, together they dominate at the same time. So he has both red and white co-dominance. Another example is in this chicken that you see here. You see both black and white feathers. So if I were to use a Punnett square to show this, uh, we could say that let's say a black chicken, I'm going to use big B, big B, is going to be crossed or reproduced with a white chicken. So I'll use big W, big W. Now notice how I'm using B's and W's, two different letters here, as opposed to when we were doing, let's say, P plants and just regular dominance, let's say height, I would use a big T for tall and little T for short. So I could use big B, little B, or big W, little W, but I don't like to do that because then I get confused. I think one dominates over the other. So to make it easy on myself, I just use a B for black and a W for white in this case. So what happens is all the offspring in this case end up with the genotype BW, BW, so forth and so on. So because this is co-dominance, what this means is that these chickens are going to look like the one that you see in this picture here, both black and white. Now what happens if I were to take, let's say, those offspring and cross them? So let me take from the F1 generation and create an F2. Now you might think if I take a black and white and a black and white and cross them, I'm going to get nothing but black and white. But if we do a Punnett square to show this, you'll notice that, yeah, half of them, let's say 50%, will come out black and white again. But 25%, or one out of four, will come out completely black, and the other 25% will come out completely white. So with co-dominance, uh, all that this really means is that if you end up with two of the same alleles, so your homozygous, that's the color that you've shown, or that's the trait, but if you receive both or two different alleles, both are going to show up at the same time. Hence the word co-dominance. Now another type of inheritance is incomplete dominance. Incomplete dominance is going to be a little similar to codominance, but with one big difference. In incomplete dominance, one doesn't fully dominate the other and they both don't dominate. What's going to happen is we're going to end up somewhere in the middle. We're not going to be completely one, we're not going to be completely the other, we're going to lie somewhere in the middle and we're going to get a blending of those two traits. So a great example of this would be in some flowers. There's a picture of a snapdragon flower and you see that it is pink. Now that's not because there's a pink allele for color, there is no pink, but what there is is a red and a white. So what happens in this case is let's say we take a red snapdragon flower, I'm going to use RR because it's pure red, and let's say we cross it with a white snapdragon, so I'm going to use WW. Again, I'm using two different letters here just so that I don't get confused and think one dominates over the other. So in this case, I end up with all the offspring getting both a red and a white allele, RW. Now, rather in codominance, if this was codominance, that would mean both red and white. But because this is incomplete dominance, the red and white are going to blend together. And what happens when you blend red with, red with white? You get the pink color that you see here. 
So a big difference between codominance and incomplete dominance. In codominance, both are clearly shown, both alleles, while in incomplete dominance, they blend together to give you uh, kind of a halfway point between those two alleles. Our third one here is going to be multiple alleles. So you'll notice up until this point that we've been talking about, whether it was Mendelian genetics or codominance, incomplete dominance, there was always two options. So for example, with pea plants, there was a tall allele, big T, and a short allele, little t. Uh, in my case of using uh, the horse example, or the chicken example, let's say, there was a black allele and there was a white allele. Or in snapdragon flowers with incomplete dominance, we said there was red and white. In many cases, there's not only going to be two alleles. What happens if there was a third option? So instead of there being just red and white, what if there was a purple allele? So in some cases, we can have three, four, five, or even more alleles just for one particular trait. And if this happens, we say that there are multiple alleles for that trait. So one great example in humans is blood type. So if you are familiar with anything with blood type, you might know that there's not just two. There's going to be an A-type blood, so you could be type A, there's an allele for that. There could be an allele for B-type blood, or there can be an allele for O-type blood. So there are three different alleles. So we say that for blood type in humans, there are three, or excuse me, multiple alleles for blood type. Now, if you know anything about blood type, you might say, well, then is there an allele? Is there a fourth one for AB blood? And actually, AB blood is codominance between both A and B. So if we were to come up with symbols or, or letters so we could do a Punnett square for this, we use the letter I for blood type. So for A and B, because they're both codominant, I'm going to use a capital I for them. I'm going to say capital I for A and a capital I for B. And in order to tell those two apart, I'll put an A on this guy here so I know that that's A, and I'll put a B on this guy. But again, because they're both codominant, I'm going to use a capital I. Now the allele for O type blood is recessive, so I'm just going to use a lowercase i for that one. So when we do our Punnett squares for something like multiple alleles, you're going to notice that we can get more outcomes. So let's say we're going to do a cross between an individual who is type AB blood. All right, so one of the parents is AB. I'm going to put a capital I A and a capital I B. And I'm going to cross that with a person who's type O blood. Now, the only, type, only way that you can have type O blood is to have both lowercase i's. You have to have both recessive alleles for O. So if I do this cross, let's see what we get. We get an IA with a lowercase i. So what type of blood would this person have? Well, they would have type A. Even though they have the O allele, the A, because it's a capital I, dominates. So that would be type A heterozygous. I can get an individual with type B blood heterozygous. Again, the capital I is going to overpower that lowercase i. Um, I can get a, another person who is A type blood heterozygous. And I can also get another person who's type B heterozygous. So I'd end up with 50% type A and 50% type B. So you notice that I get a lot of different. I can have type AB, type O, type A, homozygous or heterozygous, type B heterozygous, homozygous. So with multiple alleles, it just means that we're going to have more variation available to us. The fourth pattern of inheritance that we're going to look at is what are called sex-linked traits. So these are going to be traits that are linked specifically to the sex chromosomes. So here's a picture of a person's karyotype. Now, if you remember, we have 46 chromosomes. So here's a picture of all 46. They've been paired up with their homologous pair, so there's a total of 23 pairs. So 22 out of those 23 pairs are going to be what we call autosomes. Those are just your DNA that code for the majority of your traits. But the one I want to focus on here is the last pair, numbers 45 and 46. They are what we call the sex chromosomes. So this person in particular is a male, and the way that I know that is because their two sex chromosomes are a large X and then a smaller Y. So men have an XY when it comes to their sex chromosomes. If this is a female, females actually have two large X chromosomes. So their sex chromosomes are going to be XX. So this also explains why in our population, a human population, we have roughly 50-50 between men and women. It's because if you look at a Punnett square, if I put a female on top, put her two X's, remember she's going to give one or the other, and a male on the side, he's XY. Here's the breakdown. We have 50% of those come out as XX or females, and then the other 50% come out XY or males. So anytime that you have a kid, it's going to be a 50-50 shot between a male and a female. So when we take a look at sex-linked traits, we're going to see what happens when certain traits or disorders are linked to the sex chromosome, specifically the X chromosome. 
So one in particular is colorblindness. Red-green colorblindness is a type of sex-linked trait that is specifically attached to that X chromosome. So here in this picture, you can tell if you're red-green colorblind, you probably can't see that 74 in that picture. There's a green 74 in the center. Person with red-green colorblindness can't really tell the difference between red and green, so they're not gonna be able to see that image. Now, a way that we would do this to test or to do a Punnett square to predict probability is we can do a typical Punnett square, but we're gonna, because it's linked to the sex chromosomes, we're gonna use the XX and XY like we did on the previous one. In this case, colorblindness is a recessive sex length trait. So I'm gonna use a big B and little b in this case. I could use C, but I don't like to because a big C looks like a small C. So because it's recessive, I'm gonna say that small b is gonna be for colorblindness. I'll just abbreviate that CB. While big B, we'll just say is for normal, it's dominant. So the only way that you can get colorblindness is if you have a small B and you don't have the big B to override that or overpower it. So let's say we're gonna cross a female who has one good X. So I'm gonna put a big B on this one, but she does carry or has a bad X. She has that small B attached to that X chromosome. So does she have colorblindness? The answer is no, because this big B on this one X is gonna override, it's dominant, it's gonna dominate the bad X, so she turns out normal. But what we call her is a carrier. Why is she a carrier? Because she doesn't have the disorder, in this case colorblindness, but she does carry the allele, the bad X. So she doesn't have it, but she does carry it. Now let's say we cross her with a male that has colorblindness. So I'm gonna put a small b on this X. So why does he have it? Well, remember, men only have one X chromosome. So this Y doesn't do anything. It's not gonna override this. It's only attached to the X chromosome. So men cannot be carriers. They either have the disorder, so in this case he has the bad X, or they don't. He would have the big B on it. But he does have colorblindness, so we're gonna put the small B on it. So what would the chances be of them passing colorblindness off to their kids? Well, if we do the first one, I'm gonna get a female. I'm gonna get a big B on this one and a small B. So did this, did this girl get colorblindness? The answer is no, she's just like her mom. She's what we call a carrier. She has a good X and a bad X. How about this child here? Two X's, so it's a female, and she got two little B's or two bad X's, so she would be colorblind in this case. We have a male here. He's gonna get the good X from mom and then just the Y chromosome, so he's a boy and not gonna be colorblind, completely normal. And then here we get the bad X from mom, so I'm gonna put the small b on it and the Y, so he does have colorblindness. So you'll notice, if you think about this, what does this mean for um, the amount of males versus females that will have these sex-linked traits? We say that sex-linked traits are gonna be more likely to show up in men than there are in women, and that's because men only have one X chromosome. They don't get to get a second one to possibly override or act as a backup. So in colorblindness, you find that about one in 12 men have colorblindness, while about one in 200 females have colorblindness. And that's because, again, women have two Xs, they have a, uh, less likely to get um, the sex-linked disorder. The last pattern of inheritance that we're gonna look at is what are called polygenic traits. And if we just take this word right off the bat to break it down, the prefix poly just means many, and genic for genes. So these are gonna be traits that are coded for by many genes, or at least more than one. Everything we've talked about up until this point has only been coded for by one gene. You might've had a few alleles for it, but in this case, we're gonna have many genes coming together to code for just one trait. A great example is going to be eye color. Most students or most people when I ask them about eye color, they are under the impression that eye color is just coded for by one gene and there's gonna be two alleles. We're gonna say a blue allele and a brown allele. And most people are taught, and I'm even guilty of doing this too with my students, that uh, blue eyes is recessive, so I'll put small b, and brown eyes are dominant, so I'll put big b. And if you have blue eyes, you have two little b's. If you have brown eyes, maybe you're homozygous dominant, or maybe you're heterozygous. But if you think about it, if this was the case, how many eye colors would exist? The answer to that would just be two. You'd either have brown eyes or blue eyes. Now you might think, well, wait, maybe this is a case of incomplete dominance. So what happens, maybe if you get a blue and a brown allele, so um, instead of one being dominant, maybe they mix together and that's where you get hazel eyes from. It's incomplete dominance between blue and brown. But if that was the case, then there would only be three eye colors. But we know that when it comes to eye color, there's so many, there's a whole spectrum. And that's because eye color is not just the result of one gene, it's many genes coming together to give you just one trait, that one eye color, so it's polygenic. So to better show you this, let's use an example of eye color. 
Let's say that two genes at the same time code for eye color. In reality, we think that it's anywhere up to about six different genes, but for simplicity purposes, let's just say that it's two. We're gonna call them gene A and gene B. And let's say I'm gonna take two people with hazel eyes um, and cross them to see what kind of kids they could produce. Now, in this case, we're gonna use incomplete dominance. We're gonna say that uh, capital letters, so big A's and big B's are gonna be for darker eyes, so brown, and little letters, small a and small b, are gonna be for bluer or lighter eyes. So you can see that these two individuals have hazel eyes because they have two capitals, so two browns, and then two are lowercase, or two light eyes. So they end up somewhere in the middle there in that hazel area. So what would happen if I cross these two people together? Well, just like we do with a dihybrid cross, remember that each of these individuals is gonna pass on one of each gene, or one A and one B. So they, this person on the top could pass off this big A with this big B, so that's why I put that over here. Or that big A can go with that small B, so I put that here or that little a can go with the big B, or that little a can go with that little b. So that's where I ended up with all four of these possible um, ways that they pass it off. Same thing on the left here. So if we take a look at this dihybrid cross of all the eye colors, let's see what happens. There is a one in 16 chance that their child has all big letters, so in other words, all dark. So they're gonna have really, really dark eyes. They have nothing but dark alleles. So that would be almost like black, really dark brown eyes. There's also a one in 16 chance that they pass off all the small letters. This is a child that would have really, really light eyes, so really the bluest eyes you can see because they have all small letters. But you'll notice that most of these kids, there's a higher probability that the kids will receive maybe two alleles each, so they'll have that hazel in the middle. Um, maybe they'll get big A, big A, small b, small b, so these are those greens in the middle. Some of the kids will only get one dark, so this would be maybe blue eyes, but a little bit darker than the other one. Uh, this one has three alleles, so this would be maybe light brown. So you notice that most of the kids end up somewhere in the middle. This is why if you look at a population, you're going to have a hard time finding someone with really, really light blue or really, really dark brown. Most people have hazel green or light brown or darker blue eyes because that lies somewhere in the middle. The same thing could be said about height. Height is a polygenic trait. You'll notice that every once in a while you find someone who's really, really tall because they got all the tall alleles or someone who's really, really short. They got all short alleles but most people fall somewhere in the middle because they got some tall, some short, so they end up in the middle. So the thing with polygenic traits is because there's more than one gene coding for that trait, you get a whole spectrum or a whole uh, range of outcomes, but most people end up somewhere in the middle. So that's the last pattern of inheritance. By now, you should have a pretty good idea about codominance, incomplete dominance, multiple alleles, sex-linked traits, and polygenic traits, and how all those things play a role in modern genetics. Thanks for watching.